In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. At last God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Thus God created man, whom he greatly loved, and planting a garden in Eden, prepared a paradise for him. Sadly, the man betrayed God. He let himself be fooled by a cunning snake. He picked the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge, which God had not let him even touch. He lost the paradise that God had prepared for him. But God, however, did not cease to love man and to support him in the world into which crept the rebellious angel against God, the devil. As a result of the devil's actions, man lost the true image of God. He saw him only as harsh and punishing, completely forgetting about his mercy. Yet it was out of love for man that God sent into the world his only son, Jesus Christ, who was born of the womb of the chosen Immaculate Virgin Mary, as a teacher and healer, but most importantly, as the Lord and Savior, he showed his true image, full of tender mercy. Out of love for man, he died on the cross, redeeming all the sins of humanity. Because of this, everyone who receives him, accepts and follows his teaching, will receive eternal life. Before he died, he established his church and said that the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Sadly, the people who form the church too often have distorted the teachings of Jesus and deformed his image. So once again, he resolves to reach out to man. He chooses a simple girl from Poland to tell the world anew the truth of his mercy. Trust in his mercy that he reveals is the last resort for the salvation of the world. Unable to agree with my parents' refusal, I turned myself over to the vain things of life, paying no attention to the call of grace, although my soul found no satisfaction in any of these things. to 
so you will enter a convent there. The mystical experience of this young 19-year-old woman changed her life. In her heart, she knew that she was called to the religious life, but she did not want to oppose her parents. Now, she has no doubts. for work. Have you worked as a servant? Yes. Well, do they not want you there anymore? Is that why you are coming to us? No, mother. I never shied away from work. Since I was a child, I've heard my mother with household and my younger siblings. And then where I worked as a servant, they wanted me to stay longer. But the Lord is calling me very clearly now. If so, go to the Lord of this house and ask him if he will accept you. Would you like me to go to the chapel? Yes. Ask him, and then come back here. Of course. Przyjechała po to, by tutaj pracując zarobić na wiano. She came to work here to earn money for the dowry, required then to join the religious congregation. And so she appeared with a bundle in her hand. There were some personal belongings only. She did not even have a suitcase or a bag. It must not be forgotten that those were times of great misery in Poland after the First World War. The monasteries did not have means of subsistence, and therefore the candidates had to earn. She made a commitment to bring this dowry, which she meticulously pursued, and each month she would supply them with her earned money. This was the last year of Helena Kowalska's life as a lay person. And here we have the perfect laboratory which allows us to get to know her humanity. It is here that Helena's humanity, already mature, is visible in her great responsibility for her work. 
It was a multifaceted and an important task because she had to clean and cook and take care of the children at the same time and serve guests who came to her parents. She did it in a very efficient way. She was extremely intelligent, even though she had very little education. Everywhere she went, she gained unusual sympathy and great affection of the children she dealt with. She could entertain these children, tell stories to them, and when her repertoire of fairy tales was exhausted, she invented various funny stories because she was very joyful. They called her a jester. you to paint an image according to how you just saw me. But I can paint. Right under it. Jesus, I trust in you. Don't be afraid. I will grant you a visible help. He will help you carry out my will on earth. Faustina is incapable of painting this image. She is helpless. She has not met the confessor whom the Lord Jesus promised her. In two years, however, she is transferred to Vilnius. sisters of our uh, Lady of, of Mercy and uh, there the following year in 1830 he met uh, uh, Sister Faustina Kowalska and he became her confessor and spiritual father. against some orders of my superiors. And which orders don't you obey, sister? I obey them all. And there's no sin. Jesus told me that you will be my confessor. Sorry, who told you? Jesus. Jesus. Are you 
you sure? Yes. I've been seeing him for a long time. He showed me you many months before I ever saw you. Is everything okay with your head, sister? Excuse me? For days and all the sins of my past, I'm truly sorry and I'm asking you, Father, give me an absolution. Father Sopochko is very cautious in this matter. Being a seasoned spiritual director, he knows how to proceed with such a penitent. That's why he first sends her to a psychiatrist. Only with the results of the psychological tests in hand, and knowing that she is mentally healthy, he makes a decision. Sister, as I agreed to be your spiritual guide, I want you to disclose to me not only your sins, but also your thoughts, instigations of evil, and sister's visions. Only then I could see what truly happens in your soul. I will reveal everything to your father. This is himself told me not to hide anything from you. Otherwise, he would hide from me. And he also said, you would help me to fulfill his will on earth. I understand. Sister, please write all these words in your diary and underline these words you are certain Jesus told you himself. It is probably because of Father Sopochko that we have the diary of St. Faustina today. Not only helped her in discerning the meaning of the revelation of the image, but also found uh, Kazimierowski, the painter, uh, who painted the image that we know today as the original image of Divine Mercy. Kazimierowski was an educated man. He was an artist and painter. He lectured and circulated among the elite world of Vilnius, but he never manifested it. One can say that he was a bit mysterious. Ta tajemniczość postaci Eugeniusza Kazimierowskiego jest w pewnym sensie uzasadniona. To say that Eugene Kazimierowski's character was something of a mystery is justifiable. He was a Freemason, an active member of the Masonic community in Vilnius. Freemasons generally avoid the limelight and celebrity functions. But all Freemasons know from their meetings the identity of their fellow Freemasons. Jesus should appear out of the 
darkness. And those rays, I told you, they cannot be white and red like national flag, but pale and red like water and blood. Pale is what I turn when you come here, sister. And I turn red when you start complaining. One must not think that Sister Faustina's meetings with Kazimirovsky were very spiritual. They were not prayer sessions, but were rather technical in nature. What have you done to him? This is you know what? Paint it yourself. Who will paint you as beautiful as you are? Don't give up, please. I know that she's... Uh, she's crazy. First she says she should be like this, then like that. And now it's supposed to be yet another way. It's too humiliating. The devil always meddles in God's affairs. Jean, could you please finish the painting? Fine. But on one condition. Just a second, please. Faustina came to the painter's workshop once or twice a week for half a year. Despite many corrections, she was not happy with the image. Finally, a moment came when she accepted the work. Most important for her was that Jesus himself accepted it. Jesus said to Sister Faustina, Not in the beauty of the color, nor of the brush, lies the greatness of this image, but in my grace. And this is the most important thing. But the message is also important, the theological meaning that the image contains. the Lord as coming forth from the Holy of Holies in heaven to ensure us of the forgiveness of our sins after having entered there to bring the offering of his life to the Father as the ransom. The dark background symbolizes the total darkness in the Holy of Holies of the earthly tabernacle, which was illumined only by God's presence as he received the atoning sacrifice. That scene of Christ's coming out of the Holy of Holies with rays emanating from his wounded side represent the blood and water, that is, the Holy Spirit, as the source of life handed over, according to St. John's Gospel, at the moment of his death. As one of the prayers of St. Faustina points out, you died, Jesus, but the source of life gushed out for the souls, and a sea of mercy opened up for the whole world. 
Christus Christ Christ comes toward us as we see in the divine mercy image. He stands in the Holy of Holies. He is the covenant between God and man, and that's what the devil is afraid of. In this image, he is the only one, unique and full of mercy for us, so that if he were removed, only darkness would remain. And yes, that is how it is in the soul of a person who has no God. His hand gesture in the picture of blessing is the same hand gesture that a priest would make in confession for forgiving sins. And that uh, sense of redemption comes through that what we get from the resurrection is love poured out and the light coming out and the sacraments that they represent. of this image, I shall be granting many graces to souls, so let every soul have access to it. I promise that the soul that will venerate this image will not perish. I also promise victory over its enemies already here on earth, especially at the hour of death. I myself will defend it as my own glory. Jesus repeatedly asked for this image. He wanted it to be publicly displayed and honored. Sister Faustina passed his commands to her confessor. And finally, there was an extraordinary opportunity. It was the 1900th Jubilee year of the redemption of the world. The pastor of Our Lady of the Dawn Gate asked Father Sapochko to deliver a sermon on Good Friday. And Father Sapochko, Seizing the opportunity, asked that the image of the merciful Jesus be used as a decoration and be placed in the cloister of Our Lady of the Dawn Gate. People gazed at the image. Sapochko spoke about God's mercy with great enthusiasm. As he proclaimed it, he grew more fervent, setting aflame the hearts of many as well. While he spoke, Faustina saw Jesus in this image come alive. The rays flowed out from his heart and penetrated the hearts of the people gathered there. Faustina was a sister of the second choir, and that's why she always had to perform manual activities. She worked in the kitchen, in the bakery, and sometimes in the garden. Oh, life so dull and monotonous, how many treasures you contain. When I look at everything with the eyes of faith, no two hours are alike, and the dullness and monotony disappear. A time came when Sister Faustina became very ill. In the autumn, she was diagnosed with the first symptoms of tuberculosis. Spiritually, it was Jesus' response to her desire to suffer with him, to endure his passion, so as to save souls from eternal damnation. Gradually, however, her health improved, and in the spring, she returned to her work. Father, when you were in the Holy Land, I burned my diary. What did you do? I had a vision. An angel came to me and told me that my writings was nonsense, and told me to put my diary into the stove. And did you do that? Yes, I burned writings which you, Father, told me to keep. Why did you not wait until my return? I was taken with fear that I was doing something against God's will. As soon as I did it, an angel laughed and disappeared. It is no time to cry. 
what is lost must be restored. So we must write it down again. Over again? Yes, surely. Do you remember it? Yes, I remember. But I'm afraid to make a mistake. It seems to me that it is important what you write. If it happens so, ask the Holy Spirit for help and focus on the task. This I set upon you as your penance. One of the Lord Jesus' wishes that he revealed to Faustina was the establishment of a new religious congregation. She understood this request and shared it with her confessor, saying, God demands that there be a congregation which will proclaim the mercy of God to the whole world, and by its prayers obtain that mercy for the world. She wanted very much to fulfill his desire. Sister Faustina, together with Father Michael Sapochko, had to discern this carefully because there were many obstacles. She made her perpetual vows in her congregation where she felt well. But whenever she made up her mind to leave, she would be overwhelmed by spiritual darkness. Another obstacle was that her health began to fail more and more. We need to adorn the altar. disease hospital in Pradnik, Krakow. Father Sapochko visited her and feeling helpless asked her, Sister, how is it? The image exists but there is no feast, there is no congregation, and what next? She replied, Father, I will ask Jesus and I will answer you tomorrow. On the next day, I celebrated the Holy Mass for Sister Faustina's intention. During the Mass, a thought came to me that, just as she was unable to paint the image but only provide instruction, so she would not be able to establish the new congregation but only offer the guidelines. The Lord's promptings signify the necessity of this new congregation in the times to come. When he returned to Sister Faustina, he asked, Well, what is it, Sister? What did the Lord Jesus say? Astounded, she looked at him and said, Father, what are you saying? The Lord Jesus said that he explained everything to you during the Mass. We have the approval. We received the informator.
This is where the new congregation will be founded. I can't do it without you. You will do it. I'll be supporting you to the very end. On October 5, 1938, at four in the afternoon, Father Andras heard Sister Faustina's confession for the last time. During supper, the bell rang, which was a signal to the sisters that Faustina was dying. They all ran to her cell to pray for her. Near Sister Faustina was a special candle representing the light of Christ. The sister who was on duty with her left and soon returned with the superior. When Sister Faustina saw them, she smiled, and therefore one can say that she left the earth with a smile. She had seen heaven before. She had such a unique relationship with Jesus, and she wanted to leave this world, but she also wanted everything that God intended for her to come true in her life. Not able to express it. 
One dreadful vision described in her diary, which, if it referred to the city of Warsaw, can be said to have been fulfilled. It was a vision of a city, which she identifies as the most beautiful city in Poland, being completely destroyed in a manner similar to that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sister Faustina prayed for the city, and the punishment seemed to have been postponed for a time. If this was in fact a vision of Warsaw, then this prediction was fulfilled during the Second World War. I saw the anger of God hanging heavy over Poland. And now I say that if God were to visit our country with the greatest chastisements, that would still be great mercy, because for such grave transgressions he could punish us with eternal annihilation. I was paralyzed with fear when the Lord lifted the veil a little from me. Now I see clearly that chosen souls keep the word in existence to fulfill the measure of justice. The city of Białystok was occupied by the Germans on the 13th of September, 1939. Ten days later, the Soviets entered the city and the Germans withdrew their forces. There was a strange military parade on September the 23rd on the Kosciuszko Market Square, where military columns of both armies were passing by. The Soviets were entering Białystok and the Germans were leaving. This parade passed by within 300 to 400 meters of the house where Eugen Kazimierowski lived. It's difficult to say whether the painting of the Divine Mercy image had any effect on Kazimierowski's life. We do not know whether he converted and gave up his membership in the Freemasons as a result of this painting, but we can suppose that he experienced some remorse of conscience. This can be attested by the last two self-portraits, in which the painter represented himself as Judas. Let our judgment of soul cease, for God's mercy upon them is extraordinary. A few days before our arrival in Vilnius, a very excited director, Kondratas, called me. It turned out that they had found two documents that they had not known about before. It was a great surprise to, to us when a few weeks ago these uh, two documents were brought out and we started uh, looking through the first one which was a typescript man, uh, manuscript uh, uh, t uh, of his uh, work about the cult of uh, divine mercy and inside it fell out a letter and, and the letter was in, 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 in Latin written to the Vatican explaining the, the necessity of the cult and, and then providing as evidence this work that he had, uh, scholarly work that he had uh, uh, prepared. So it, it was an interesting and wonderful surprise for us and I think uh, very nice that we have this document. Most excellent and reverend eminence, may your honorable excellency wish to accept this attached treatise on the mercy of God and the need to institute a feast of mercy. The letter found in Vilnius should be, in my opinion, related to the pilgrimage of Father Sapochko to Rome. 
Father Sapochko arrived in Rome during the Holy Week, on Good Friday. And on Holy Saturday, he wanted to meet with the Secretary of State to hand him a petition regarding the establishment of the Feast of Divine Mercy. And, of course, such a day is for everybody a day off. He was sent to the Congregation for Divine Worship, but it was already closed as well. So Father Sapochko went to one of the Poles working in the Curia to Father Jan Sheik. He advised him to pass this matter through the conferences of the Polish Episcopate through the Apostolic Nunciature in Warsaw. The treatise attached to Father Sapochko's letter contains several forms of devotion from the revelations of Sister Faustina, such as the chaplet, the litany of divine mercy, and the divine mercy image. Since these matters were considered too new, in need of verification, and even implausible, that is probably why the letter received no response. That's something that uh, happens very often in these types of revelations. The church is very careful in discerning these things because it is true they can have very different sources. And so it takes a lot of time, prayer, and study before the church will come and say, this is true. The devotion to the divine mercy had already begun to spread during the war, both in Poland and abroad. One of the people who was introduced to this devotion was a Marian priest, Father Joseph Jarzembowski, who met Father Michael Sapochko in Vilnius. This is amazing. And it's surprising that he chose her. We have degrees and PhDs, and we think we are the wisest ones. And we are unable to listen. That's why he chose her. Can I take it to America? Of course. I hope that not only brothers will be interested in it, but the whole continent. If the revelations were true, God's grace will make everyone hear about his mercy. Father Jarzembowski, he was obligated to follow the 24-hour registry of residence requirement. In this way, the NKVD would know of the person's whereabouts at all times and kept an eye on one's life and activities. Jarzembowski, out of fear of becoming recognized as a well-known and influential educator in Warsaw, and deported to a gulag, he did not register, but chose to hide in various religious homes and parishes. He traveled at night because due to his height of two meters and 10 centimeters, he was easily recognizable. He decided to use his US visa to flee the Soviet occupied region of Poland and Lithuania, which he obtained before the outbreak of the second world war that was soon to expire. see the permit to leave, there was no doubt in Father Joseph's mind that he owed everything to Divine Mercy. He promised that if he managed to leave the Soviet-occupied Poland and Lithuania and arrive safely in the U.S., he would spread the devotion to God's mercy for the rest of his life. You have 
ticket to run away. Then Kabudeke issued a warrant. He is the ticket to Kaunas for 5 a.m. From there, you will go to Vladivostok and then on a ship to Japan. Thank you, thank you. Please, let no one see you. No, don't. God bless you. Upon the arrival in Vladivostok, he was told that individuals without valid Japanese visas would have to wait for 10 days to board the next ship. We are closed. No, 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 no but, but it's really urgent. My ferry is about to leave, sir. I have to follow the procedures. But I'm begging you, please. I am very sorry. Father Yazimbowski no longer doubted that he was miraculously led by God's mercy. Immediately after reaching Japan, he gave a retreat about God's mercy to the members of the Polish Embassy. He arrived in the United States in Seattle, then by train he traveled to Washington, D.C. to the Marian Father's home. There, from the 1st of May in 1941, he began to disseminate the message of God's mercy in keeping with the promise he made to the Lord. Washington, Washington is the first base for Yazembovsky. He helps in various parishes. He makes contact with Orchard Lake. He publishes materials about divine mercy. They are not well received, but even where they're not, he doesn't get discouraged. He preaches where he can, mostly in Polish parishes, but also in a few American parishes as well. In 1943, he goes to Mexico. At about the same time, the Marian Fathers, who were based in Washington, D.C., acquire the Eden Hill property in the town of Stockbridge, Massachusetts. This is the place where today the National Shrine of Divine Mercy is located. It is not only a national center of promotion of the Divine Mercy message and devotion limited to the United States. This shrine radiates this devotion to Brazil and Mexico the Philippines, to Poland, Great Britain, and other countries, with great power. All the content that Jarzembowski brought with him began to produce a rich harvest. In fact, we have 25 websites with nearly 3 million unique visitors every year. People who are searching and are hungry to understand and live God's divine mercy. In fact, we hear from a lot of people around the world about how much they need God's mercy. And in fact, it was John Paul II himself who said, there's nothing the world needs more than God's divine mercy. So why is this important? Because we are taking his same directive to be apostles of divine mercy. And as Jesus said to St. Faustina, unless we pass through the doors of his mercy, we must pass through the doors of his justice. So our hope is to have the whole world pass through his doors of mercy.
Mother, please. Poor Seska, you burden her son. But he does not look like her or her husband. Miss Kauzova, not now. Please congratulate Miss Gorshevska and say that I will visit her in the coming days. But if everyone is called Joseph, then the probability of pathetic is decreasing. Everyone can choose a name, but when they are undecided and ask me for a hint, I always say Joseph. After Saint Joseph. <laughs> I always admired him. Father Sapochko, together with his friend Father Shvirsky, who later became a bishop, tried to save Jews. They issued baptismal certificates and in this way saved about 100 people. Unfortunately, both priests became targets of the Gestapo, which issued warrants for their arrest. was also a confessor of the Ursuline sisters, and that is why the sisters decided to bring him to Charnebur, a small town 12 kilometers from the center of Vilnius, located in an area by the forest. They brought him dressed as a nun, and they placed him in the house that is still standing today, and has been documented as authentic. It was a private house, where two nuns were also hiding. There, Father Sopochko lived, but obviously not under his own name. Since he was on the Gestapo's wanted list, and the homes were frequently checked and inspected, the sisters, with the help of their acquaintances, made documents for him. Here in Charnebur, he stayed as Václav Rodzevich, known to the local people as a carpenter. Father Sapochko stayed in Charnebur until August the 14th, 1944, when he could safely return to Vilnius. Since Father Sapochko directed Marian Sodality of Catholic Women, one of its members, Jadwiga Yushinska, approached Father Sobotchko and said that she wanted to start the new congregation that Jesus had requested of St. Paul's dinner. In a very short time, within six months, other candidates joined her. Over the space of two years, when Father Sobotchko surrounded them with his spiritual care, it was already known that there were six of them. What was so strange about this number is that when this group of six made their vows in 1942, Saint Faustina foresaw this number of sisters and had recorded this vision in her diary many years before. One day, I saw a small chapel in which six sisters were receiving Holy Communion from our confessor, Father Sopotko, who was wearing a surplice and stole. There were no decorations and no kneelers in the chapel. And when I was speaking with the last living member of the six, Adela Alibekov, she said to me, when we came to this place right here in Vilnius, 
where there was a convent of Carmelite nuns who admitted us to their chapels so that we could make our religious vows. The convent was already prepared for evacuation. Everything in the chapel was gone except for a nila, which still remained. Adela added, I put the nila behind the door because I thought, who will kneel on it? Which one of us? Is it the father or one of us? She placed the nila behind the door and began to cry. At that time, she did not know the passage from the diary of St. Faustina, where it simply stated, Six, no ornaments, not even a nila. And then they prayed to God. Humbling myself at the feet of the Most High Majesty. Oh, my Jesus, how immensely I rejoice at the assurance you have given me that the congregation will come into being. I no longer have the least shadow of a doubt about this, and I see how great is the glory which it will give to God. It will be the reflection of God's greatest attribute, that is His divine mercy. The divine mercy. <laughs> churches in Vilnius were closed, and among them was the church of St. Michael the Archangel. This church was destined for destruction. The altars were blocked off, and valuable works of historical or religious art were either destroyed or stolen. The image of divine mercy, however, was left behind, because it was not considered to have any artistic value. In the 1950s, two members of the Marian Sodality, Janina and Bronislava, decided to act. Using pseudonyms, they purchased the image. What do you want? Good morning. Can we bother you for a moment? Um, we just wanted to ask about that old picture hanging there. What about that? Oh, it's worthless. But my uncle painted it and uh, we would like to have it as a souvenir. This is state painting. It belongs to the Lithuanian state. But that's impossible. It's too ugly. It would only deface the ruins of the Lithuanian state. Listen, perhaps we could... Uh, Save the reputation of the Lithuanian state and uh, buy it off at a nominal charge. Hmm? What kind of charge would save the reputation of the Lithuanian state? Uh, what is that? I looked at this image and thought to myself, Jesus Mary, what a nightmare, what an ugly nightmare. 
Not only was it ugly, but the image had been enlarged because the recess of the altar was semicircular and the image itself was rectangular in nature. Someone had added a semicircular portion of canvas to it. Fortunately, this was on a separate stretcher, and so it was not a problem for me. There was slack in the image, and it was full of putties that had been repainted. There was also some whitewashing and stains, and the face resembled a strange-looking bearded priest. I sighed, Oh, dear Mother of God. Faustina was present when this image was painted, and she cried when she saw him. But what a cry it must have been. I imagined the painting and found that the image was heavily repainted, and not only once, but most likely several times. Also, since it had dried out and had begun to crack, someone had saturated it with wax, which was a very popular technique in those places. It was a yellowish-green color. I said, well, there was a lot of work to do. The painting is relatively young, only from the 1930s. If such a relatively recent painting has gone through such an ordeal, then the restoration would be very difficult. It was stretched over several canvases, and it had been subject to constant temperature and humidity fluctuations. It had been rolled up in the attic, and that was the worst thing that could have happened to it. But thankfully, it survived. One had to start by removing the coating on the surface. This was a very dangerous procedure because if the painting was made in 1934 and repainted in the 1950s, the time difference is negligible. Twenty years is nothing. The solubility of the paint layer and that of the surface coat would be the same. It needs to be removed millimeter by millimeter. It is wise to start the repainting in less noticeable places, usually on the edges of the painting. The repainting over the face was of very good quality. If it were not the fact, as I would soon discover, that it looked completely different from the original. I removed the surface coat from half of the face. That is how it is always done. Then proceeded to take a picture. When I went with the camera to the picture, I saw that the right side of the face had completely a different expression. The gaze of each eye was different and the lips were also completely different. I removed the rest of the overcoat and saw a completely different face. When the conservation work was approaching the end, the image was already located in the chapel and no one observed it except the sisters, of course, for the reasons of safety. The sisters arrived. Ursula Grzegorczy came as well. She saw the image with a restored face. And as she was standing, looking completely silent, she said that this face looked just like Christ from the Holy Shroud of Turin. For the first time, this similarity drew attention for the first time, this similarity was noticed by Father Serafim Michalenko, who showed me the effect of comparing both images, which was done at his request in the 1990s. The results of my anthropological studies of the two faces from both images show a complete convergence with such characteristic facial points as the middle part of the eyebrows, the base of the nose, the cheekbones, jaws, the wings of the nose, the beginning of the upper and lower lip, and chin. It's worth analyzing the same details by observing the images in three dimensions. It is a face model created by Professor Mignaro in 2002, based on the measurements of the Shroud of Turin and the veil from Oviedo. The veil of Oviedo is the object that covered the face of Jesus when the body was still hanging on the cross and this veil remained there on the face until the body was placed on the shroud. Then the veil was removed and the body was covered with the shroud. Traces of blood on the shroud and veil give us full information of how the face of Jesus looked like. I put all three images on each other, and it turned out that the eight points determining the most characteristic features of the face perfectly matched. I also think that it is worth seeing it from a wider perspective, when we do not limit ourselves to such a fragment of the Shroud of Turin. If we put Kazimierowski's painting here, just bringing it to the proportions you can see on the Shroud of Turin, 
Of course, nowadays such a proportional mapping of the image from the shroud would not be a problem. It would be enough to project the image from the shroud onto the canvas and the effect would have been obtained mechanically. However, as we know, Kazimierowski did not use such a technique. His painting, therefore, was made, one could say, in an intuitive way. He only followed the instructions of Faustina, who told him how she had seen Jesus. If you wanted to apply the probability calculus, you would have to do at least a thousand face images to finally get proportions such as the ones on the shroud. This means that we cannot talk about accidental action here. It is hereby made known that the Supreme Congregation of the Holy Office, having examined the visions and revelations attributed to Sister Faustina of the Congregation of Our Lady of Mercy, has resolved as follows. 1. That the dissemination of images and writings advocating devotion to divine mercy in the form proposed by the said sister to Faustina divine mercy is in the form proposed by the said sister Faustina is forbidden. 2. That the task of removing such images as have already been displaced for public veneration is to be left to the discretion and judgment of the bishop. The ban on spreading the devotion to divine mercy according to the vision of Sister Faustina was introduced by the Holy See for various reasons, but the main one was the lack of availability of the original documentation and inaccurate translations of the passages of the diary into Italian. The diary was poorly copied and then poorly translated. It also did not have an adequate theological commentary. There were many errors, but the Holy See issued a ban indeed. There was a ban. That was one thing. The second part of this document contained a clear instruction. Give a serious warning to Father Sapochko. Gravissimum monitum. He was admonished by the Holy See. This was a serious sanction. <laughs> the rising of illiterate. <laughs> Maybe they fell in love. <laughs> you know what? I will not live to see it, but you will. She's going to be a saint. And the Feast of Mercy will be established. In the life of Father Sapochko, St. Faustina's predictions that he will be shunned and that he will be isolated were also fulfilled. It is clear that a person under the observation of the Holy See is rather avoided because nothing good may come out of it. And Father Sapochko experienced the same thing in his life. On the one hand, he remained obedient to the church as he no longer preached the divine mercy devotion based on the private revelations of Sister Faustina. But on the other hand, he remained faithful to the demands of Jesus. Until the end of his life, he preached the message and devotion of the divine mercy, recovering its biblical foundation, its patristic sources, as well as speaking and writing about the spirit of the liturgy of the divine mercy Sunday. I knew her. She wasn't insane. She had the most humble soul I've ever got to know. Most of the things she said have already come to pass. The war, the difficulties, the congregation. Yeah. Thanks for the information. I will read it for sure. 
Cardinal Wojtyla was fascinated by these documents presented by Father Michael Sopochko, and three months later, he took up the case to Cardinal Ottaviani, the then prefect of the Holy Office, today known as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. I am asking for your honest opinion, Cardinal. What do you think about Sister Faustina Kowalska? I think it's high time to start the informative process. You need to examine it. The divisions were untrue. The card would not have survived. True. Start when witnesses are still alive. The ban on spreading the divine mercy message and devotion also had a good side because various extraneous things were added to these original revelations of Sister Faustina. They were often theologically incorrect, and it appears that the Church was given time to remove all the accretions and errors in order to purify this truth revealed by our Lord Jesus. Sopochko spent the last years of his life in Bialystok in the religious house of the Congregation of the Missionary Sisters of the Holy Family. He was convinced that his work produced no fruit, and so this was a very difficult time for him. The decree of the Holy Office was in force, the image remained outside of Poland, the congregation numbered but a few members, and there was no feast of the Divine Mercy. He had not found anyone who would continue his work and mission. Although the informative process had begun in 1965, its progress was very slow. And on February 15, 1975, Father Sopochko passed away. Sister Faustina's feast day. The Divine Providence, however, had already prepared another person who was to continue the work of Michał Sopochko. It was the Polish Cardinal, Karol Wojtyła. However, as a result of the activities and interventions of Cardinal Wojtyła, on April 15, 1978, the Vatican lifted the ban on the spreading of the message and the new forms of the devotion to the Divine Mercy according to the vision of Sister Faustina Kowalska. Six months later, Cardinal Wojtyla became Pope. Abemus Papam! Eminentissimum ac reverendissimum Dominum, Dominum Carolum, Sancte Romane Ecclesiae, Cardinalem, there are many indications that it was Jesus himself who chose Carol Wojtyla to fulfill his desire and establish the feast of divine mercy. Wojtyla did so in the millennial year as John Paul II. On the same day, he also elevated Sister Faustina to the honors of the altar as the first saint of the new millennium. Dear brothers and sisters, today I am repeating these simple and sincere words of Sister Faustina, that together with her and all of you, we are to glorify the unimaginable mystery of divine mercy. That's why today, in this sanctuary, I want to make a solemn act of entrusting the world to divine mercy. If we open the encyclical Divas Misericordia of John Paul II, 
under point 13, we find an idea which was very close to Father Sapochko, who said that divine mercy, as an attribute of God, is the most important one for every human being. What I was very much touched, and I keep it in my heart, what Jean Paul II said in the first encyclic on the divine mercy, that the, the, the world of today, the society, the world is forgetting even the idea of mercy. We are looking at efficiency, we are looking at organization, we are looking at so many things, and the mercy has no place anymore in the relation between the people, in the relation when they're meeting each other, when meeting the relation of the people in the society. Everybody is fighting for his own rights. The church is beautiful only when she is merciful. The mercy is so important. As Jesus in the gospel, always uh, meeting the sinners, uh, meeting the poor people, meeting the sick people, uh, uh, consoling and uh, not condemning. But, uh, well, so uh, I think the message is passing. 1 On January the 1st, 2005, Priest Mieczysław Mokrzycki, today's Archbishop of Lviv, invited us to a feast day dinner to the papal apartments. That was the custom. And I remember, during this dinner, everyone had the opportunity to talk to the Holy Father. Of course, as a postulator for the cause of Father Sapochko, I raised the issue of his beatification, because it is known that if the Holy Father becomes interested, the lower officials will get to work with greater fervor. And when I spoke about Father Sapochko, the Holy Father listened to me carefully, and suddenly he looked at me and said, I knew him. I knew him very well. He was a holy man. Those words meant everything to me. And indeed, although St. John Paul II did not manage to decide about the beatification, it was his successor, Benedict XVI. daughter, Asha, Joanne, sitting next to me, put her hand on my shoulder and said, 
Auntie, you're from the congregation that says, Jesus, I trust in you, right? So like a professional sister, I said, yes, Asha, yes. And at this point, I again felt my own internal pain. And Asha squeezed my hand and asked, Auntie, how many times a day do you say, Jesus, I trust in you? And at that moment, I looked into her eyes, because for me, this question from a disabled person was a sign that it did not come from her. And I said, Asha, I do not know how many times, but often. And she, even more strongly, with such power and gesture, pressed her shoulder on me, said, Auntie, you believe in what you say, and you can do it. And at this point, my heart was moved precisely by the fact that as a religious sister, I say, Jesus, I trust in you. But I do not really trust. And only then did I start to cry, but with real tears, over the lack of my own trust in God. I hugged Asha. At night, I went in front of the tabernacle. I looked at the image into the eyes of Jesus, and for the first time, I said from the bottom of my heart, I trust in you. I ripped up my letter of resignation, and the hospice, which was something undoable, began to progress, was completed, and began to serve. Today, our hospice mission in Lithuania celebrates its 10th year. I hospicjum, które było czymś nierealnym do, do zrealizowania, powstało, służy i już dzisiaj dziesiąty rok mija, kiedy jesteśmy tu w misji hospicjalnej. Miłosierdzie w czyny jest jedną z ważniejszych punktów. Mercy in action is one of the most important forms of devotion. Because, as it turns out, even on the basis of research on this concept of divine mercy in the diary, it usually comes into association with verbs. The diary clearly shows that mercy, or showing mercy, lies in the fact that the positions of the recipient and the one who gives become even. Mercy is to be the identity of a human person, not just his single gesture. And that means that practically everything we do is to be imbued with mercy. So we have to look at everyone with mercy. We have to extend to them our hand with mercy. We have to pass them on the street with mercy. We have to be open to them in the same way that merciful Jesus is to everyone. To the one who comes barefoot, he or she is to radiate his mercy. But divine mercy is non abstraction. It should live in the in the heart of everybody, and that's a, a challenge for you, for me, for everybody. <laughs> John Paul II's entrustment of the world to the Divine Mercy sped up the development of the devotion. Divine Mercy Sunday is celebrated on all continents, but Sister Faustina's mission continues to be fulfilled. As the end of the world comes near, it will light up many more hearts. I feel certain that my mission will not come to an end upon my death, but will begin. Oh, doubting souls, I will draw aside for you the base of heaven to convince you of God's goodness, so that you will no longer continue to wound with your distrust the sweetest heart of Jesus. God is love and mercy.